Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do my Friday Reads where I wrap up the weekend reading and any other bookish news that has gone on during the week. This is going to be a good one because I finished four books since the last Friday Reads video, so I have a lot of updates and I will try to spend the bulk of this video on the Friday Reads portion where I talk about the books that I finished, with one little exception. I did a full review of Less is Lost. I'm going to put a link to it in the description down below. So check that out if you want a little more. When we, when I do the actual Friday Reads portion of the video, I am not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. Although we'll see how that works, because frankly, a lot of the time I will say I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about something, and then I'll spend a lot of time talking about it. So we'll see what happens. But we'll get to the Friday Reads portion in a little bit. In my last video... The news about Salman Rushdie had just broken about an hour before I finished it. Thank you everybody for the support and the kind comments about it. It was a really upsetting piece of news. I am glad that Salman Rushdie is okay. It's, it, I mean, it's still not good. Obviously there are going to be permanent impacts on him and his life, let alone just from the fact of his age. Any kind of assault is not good, but this was not a good one. So I'm glad that he is okay and expected to make a recovery. That is good news. And a lot of people are now interested in picking up Salman Rushdie's books, which I think is a good thing. The reason they came into their attention is maybe not as good. Obviously, we all wish it hadn't happened, but it is good that his work is going to be picked up by a lot more people at this point. So that is something that will come out of this. I guess you always have to look for silver linings. The other thing I had mentioned was that we were going to be driving to Spokane on Saturday to see the musical Come From Away. I was almost done with the book The Day the World Came to Town by Jim DeFeedy. When I filmed my Friday Reads video, I did finish it later that day. So Come From Away is a musical that is really about the same story that The Day the World Came to Town is. I don't think the musical is actually based on the book, but I am wearing my t-shirt that I got as a souvenir. It says, Welcome to the Rock. The Rock is um, Gander Newfoundland, and I really loved the show. I really love the book. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. I'll talk about the book in a little bit, but the musical was really great, and I had mentioned this in my Friday Reads video, but it was actually really good timing that I was listening to the day the world came to town and that we went to see Come From Away because when things like what happened to Salman Rushdie happen and with the difficult news cycle that we've had for the last eight years, it feels like uh, you need reminders of the ways people can be good. I always say... People will surprise you by being terrible, but they will also surprise you by being wonderful. And The Day the World Came to Town and Come From Away is a story about people rising to a very bad situation and reminding you of the good parts of humanity. So that was really good. It was a very good show as well. The cast was fantastic, really well staged. We liked it so much that when we got home, we watched it again. <laughs> Apple TV has a filmed version of Come From Away. And we watched it. And it was also good. That involved the Broadway cast. And I'm glad we watched it again. So many tears. Because 9-11 is very emotional for me. But also just the story. And there's a lot. It's very emotional. But it is also uplifting. So I would recommend it. If you don't have access to the musical itself live. They are still touring. I, I don't know if they'll be in your area or if you can afford tickets, anything like that. But if you have Apple TV, you can access the musical that way. And I would definitely recommend it. It's a really great show. It is really hot where we are. We've had another week of 100 plus degree days. Uh, we keep breaking the temperature record for where I live. And it's a lot. Um, we have been kind of hunkered down. Poor Jamie is bored out of her mind. Joel did manage to get her out for a walk this morning before it got too hot, so she really enjoyed that, and uh, we'll probably be lying low this morning. Although we are planning to go to Celtic Fest. We haven't gone in two years because of the pandemic. So this it's all outside, so hopefully it should still be okay. We're still a little wary of the pandemic. A couple of people we've known just came down with COVID again. And I still remember how long it took for me to feel normal. <laughs> I still don't feel normal, but 
how long it took for me to feel approaching normal after I had COVID in January, and I just don't want to mess with it again. But we are planning to go to Celtic Fest this weekend, so that should be interesting. And maybe I'll have some stories for you next week. Stay tuned. The only other thing I want to mention before we get into the actual Friday Reads portion of the video is just a quick apology, actually, because in my last Friday Reads, I mentioned monetization. This was something that was inspired by a video that Brian at Bookish had done in response to a video that Steve Donahue did, which was in response to a video that Brian at Bookish did. Follow that train of thought. But I, I didn't say anything in my video, my Friday Reads video, uh, that I, I need to apologize for. But on Brian's video, I did leave a comment that was perhaps a little upset about the things that Steve had said. And I, I believe at this point, Brian has turned off comments on his video. Uh, but since I had left a comment publicly, I figured I would just put it out there and say I should not have left the comment that I did. It feels like I made it a little personal as someone who spends a lot of time and energy and adds a lot of stress to my days to make content and who does monetize this channel. Maybe I took it a little personally and I shouldn't have. So Again, I left the comment publicly, so I figured I would just put out an apology publicly to Steve and uh, leave it at that. Let's go into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. As I said, I finished four books this last week. The first one is obviously The Day the World Came to Town, 9-11 in Gander, Newfoundland by Jim DeFeedy. I finished this the same afternoon that I filmed my last Friday Reads and uploaded it, and I, again... I really liked this book a lot. It is in my top two nonfiction books of the year so far. The one thing that was interesting was that I hadn't realized that the book was published in 2002. And when it got to the afterward, I was expecting a lot more. This isn't a complaint about the book, by the way. It was more me not realizing when the book was published. So I expected a lot more of an afterward about the lives of the people that it talks about going forward. And because it was published in 2002, it only goes about a year. So <laughs> I was a little surprised by that. But there is information about them and actually come from away updates about some of the same people and things that happened to them in the years since. And of course, there's information about them. But it was just a really good book. And again, it was really well timed, not just because I saw the musical the day after I finished it, but because with everything that happened to Salman Rushdie, I really needed that reminder that people can be good. <laughs> and I would definitely recommend it for that. Obviously, because it is about 9-11, there are triggers about that. It can be very sad, if you are unfamiliar with the premise of it. On 9-11, obviously, there were a lot of planes in the air, because at any given moment, there are a lot of planes moving around the world. When the United States shut down airspace, any plane that was headed toward the U.S. had to redirect. Gander, Newfoundland has an airport that is really large, because it used to be a hub in the old days, when you didn't have the fueling that you have now, or the technology in the planes that you have now, planes couldn't get across the ocean without stopping to refuel. And Gander was a place that they would do that. And because of that, it has a long storied history. Um, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth stopped through there on a flight at one point, and the airport is still there. So because it is a small town, low risk because there's a low population and because it had the big airport a lot of planes were redirected there i could be wrong with my math but 38 planes and roughly 7,000 people were redirected to gander newfoundland and the people of gander and its surrounding towns had to figure out how to support roughly 7,000 people and the animals that were on board the planes and take care of the planes themselves because planes are not built to sit on runways and they really rose to the occasion, especially since these were people who were coming from all over the world. There were language barriers. These people were stressed and hungry and confused and had nowhere to go. When many of them got off the plane, they didn't even know what had happened because the pilot and the flight attendants had not told them what was going on. A lot of them were stressed because they knew people in New York and didn't know if they were alive or not, if they had gotten to safety and couldn't get in touch with them because this was before cell phones and texting was a really common thing and before social media. So people weren't able to like post, I'm alive, I'm safe. People had no idea and they were had no idea when they were going to be getting home. So the people of Gander and its surrounding communities 
really made them feel at home and took care of them. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. I would absolutely recommend it if you can get past the 9-11 thing. 9-11 is a really emotional thing for me. I cry very easily <laughs> with something like that. So I recommend it as long as you can kind of deal with that. On our drive to Spokane, Joel and I had made a sort of interesting decision about what we were going to do to spend the time in the car. So from where we live, it is about a three, three and a half hour drive to Spokane, where the show was. We decided we would try something a little different and listen to an audiobook. And we chose something that I have wanted to read for a really long time, a really long time, and have not gotten around to reading. And something that Joel has been interested in reading as well. He has seen the HBO movie, I Have Not. It's Angels in America by Tony Kushner, a gay fantasia on national themes. Part one is called Millennium Approaches and part two is Perestroika or the other way around. I don't actually remember which part is called which. Part one is Millennium Approaches, part two is Perestroika. There is an audio that has the cast of the 2018 revival on Broadway that starred Nathan Lane, Andrew Garfield, Lee Pace, and it is, if not the best audiobook I have ever listened to, it is certainly one of the best. The production quality is fantastic. I have not listened to any other audiobook that has felt as dynamic as this one does. Maybe it's because the cast had performed it on Broadway. It almost seems like they recorded them while they performed because you really get the sense that they are moving and interacting with each other as they are talking. And I don't think I've ever experienced that in an audio before, even an audio that has a whole cast of actors performing the part. It feels, again, dynamic and like they are interacting with the world. The sound effects are really good and well done. There are musical cues throughout. It really is like listening to a production of the show with a fantastic cast. Everyone is uniformly great. In part one, Bobby Cannavale actually reads the stage directions. And in part two, Edie Falco takes over. So even then, you have a really great actor taking on part of it and making it elevating the material. Because reading the stage directions could be very dry. And yet they do a very good job of it. If you are unfamiliar, this is a classic Pulitzer Prize winning play that was first produced in the early 90s. I can't remember exactly when. It is copyright 1992, 1994, 1996. So I'm going to assume that 1992 or 93 was when it was produced on Broadway for the first time. It is a classic. I have not read it until now. I didn't want to see the HBO adaptation with Meryl Streep, Al Pacino, Mary Louise Parker, Jeffrey Wright, who actually was in the original cast on Broadway, because I wanted to read the play first. I just haven't gotten around to it. And then once I heard that they had used the cast of the revival to create an audiobook, I really wanted to listen to the audiobook. So this was a great way to do it. Obviously, it's not the happiest listening because if you're unfamiliar, this is about people in New York City in 1985 and 1986, and AIDS looms large. One of the characters is Roy Cohn, who is a real-life person who was terrible and did a lot of really bad things. Among them, he was Donald Trump's mentor, and Donald Trump dropped him like a hot stone when Roy Cohn was dying of AIDS. Yeah, that's a thing that happened. So that is one of the characters. As he he goes on a journey and dies of AIDS, there is a Mormon who is struggling with his sexuality. Um, there is a boyfriend who leaves his lover because he can't deal with the fact that his lover is dying of AIDS. His lover is Prior Walter, who has this long-standing family with a lot of history in the United States. And Prior becomes a sort of prophet because an angel visits him at the end of part one. And it is a very complex play. I'm not sure I quite understand everything that happens in it, but it is a really deep and profound and intelligent and surprisingly funny play as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing an adaptation of this. Of course, it's the HBO adaptation. We own the DVDs of it and we have, Joel had them he, he brought them into our marriage, uh, but I haven't wanted to watch it until I read the play. So now we can actually watch it. So there's, there is that, but um, a commenter, Kurt Anderson, uh, 
pointed out that you can actually watch the production of this that created the audiobook. I believe there is only one cast swap. Instead of Lee Pace, you get Russell Tovey, and that is on the National Theater um, website. So you can pay to see that. We might do that very well. Really, really great book. It is probably in my top two books that I have read this year. I don't quite know what to do with that, though. I have to think about it because I have fiction and nonfiction separated this year. I don't really know how to throw a drama in there. Like, do I have a third category? <laughs> um, but it's really fantastic, and I absolutely recommend it. And um, I'm really interested in seeing how the HBO movie would adapt this, and uh, maybe even seeing the production from of the show itself that had most of the actors who did the audio. Just really well done. Very good. Highly, highly recommended. Hi, this is Editing Greg jumping in because I realized when I was talking about Angels in America, I didn't mention the fact that Bethesda Terrace or Bethesda Fountain is actually a key landmark in or location in the play. And that was really interesting or particularly of note for me because when I lived in New York City, that was one of my favorite locations. Not in the summer. It gets very, very crowded in the summer. Not that it's not pretty in the summer, but I used to love it in the winter because especially when it would start to snow, it is gorgeous. So I used to love walking into Central Park and going to visit that spot. And it was really nice that it was featured so heavily in the play. I guess it's not too surprising because Bethesda Fountain is an angel, but I just was surprised by that. And it reminded me of a place I really loved when I lived in New York City. The next book that I finished was The Queens of Sarmiento Park by Camila Sosa Viada and translated by Kit Maud. This was the selection for the LGBTQ in translation read-along for August and September. It was deliberately chosen to fit with Women in Translation Month, which is August. Camila Sosa Viada is a trans woman and trans women are women, so it counts. This was really interesting because... The first 30 pages, which I think is all I had read when I did my last Friday Reads video, I was really liking it. And it was very into like the magical realism. And that part kind of went away for a little bit and then came back a little more toward the end. It's a very sad book. It seems very fused with memoir, although apparently Camilla Sosa Viada has pushed back on that idea, saying that this is not really memoir. It is a work of fiction. I don't know how accurate that is. It seems very much inspired by experiences that she had as a sex worker and things like that. I mean, I'm sure it is a fictionalized version of a lot of that, but it seems like it is more inspired by that. But that's all speculation on my part. Interestingly as well, the original title of this book was Las Malas, and the I had made fun of the American version of it, which is called Bad Girls, and has a very different cover that looks like just something you would find in the erotica section. But it turns out Bad Girls is actually a much more accurate, or at least it's more close to the title of the original. And given how provocative Camilla Sosa Viada likes to be about this subject, or uh, provocative, almost transgressive, um, not willing to go along with things that are meant to coddle the subject matter, Bad Girls actually feels like a better title than The Queens of Sarmiento Park. I do still, however, really love this cover. It is just beautiful. So I really liked it, but there are some little issues that I had. We're talking through a lot of them in the group right now. And as always, the discussion group info will be in the description box down below. If you would like to participate, I recommend it. There's a really great group of people in there, and there have been some very interesting opinions about the book. Um... I liked it. I ultimately I don't think I liked it as much as the first 30 pages promised that I would, but I'm also still really thinking about it. And the fact that I have spent so much time thinking about it since I finished is probably a good sign for the book itself. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about it now. Maybe if I have more to say uh, next week, I'll uh, revisit it. But uh, a lot of that will depend on how the conversation in the group goes, because um that will kind of depend on where I go with this. I'm still digesting it a lot. And again, the fact that I'm still digesting it days after I finished it says a lot about the book and uh, the quality of it. The final book that I finished this week was Less Is Lost by Andrew Sean Greer. Again, I have a full review 
of it in video form that I will link down below. This is the sequel to Less by Andrew Sean Greer, which I did a full Pulitzer Prize deep dive, and I'll link that down below if you would like. Ultimately, I did not like that book. It feels reactionary in a way, and I talk a lot about that in the video review that will be linked down below. But it feels like Andrew Sean Greer took a lot of the critiques that people, myself included, have about the book less and wrote them all into this book to try to get rid of them. And some of them don't even work with what is established in Less. Um, and again, I talk about a lot of this in the video, but for instance, Arthur Less has a very casual approach to sex in the book Less, and suddenly he's almost like a prude in Less is Lost, and it does not make sense with what has already been established. Less is about an American abroad. That is one of the things that its fans always point to, the fact that it is a satire of what Americans are like in the world. And Less is Lost feels really determined to say something big about America, but it ultimately doesn't. And the way in which it fails to do that, and the way in which it makes plays at actual meaning about race in America or homophobia in America is kind of offensive. I did not like it. I did not like this book at all. One of the things, and again, I talk more about this in the video, is Arthur Less, again, has a signature suit in this book. And he gets rid of it along the way. He goes to Walmart, buys, like, Walmart drag, so he can look like your everyday American person. Um, the joke in the book is that he doesn't want to look like he's from the Netherlands. It's this recurring joke that gets very tiresome, where if people are unsure of what he's about, meaning, like, gay, they'll ask him, are you from the Netherlands? And he wants... Yeah, it's dumb. So anyway, he does that so he can have sort of safe passage through the South. So what Andrew Sean Greer is hinting at is that there are places in this country where LGBTQIA plus people or people of color don't feel safe, where they don't feel like they can access and where they might not even be welcome. Places where if they grow up, they would try to get away from as they become an adult. He's hinting at that. That's a serious thing. But he treats it as a joke without a punchline, and I really did not like that a lot. There are a lot of other problems that I had with the book. All of them will be in the video down below. I just, I can't imagine that anyone who is a fan of Less will really love this book. I think if you are a bigger fan of Less than I am, you will probably like Less is Lost, but I can't imagine anybody thinking it's really necessary. I found it really ham-handed and badly plotted. So I can't imagine anybody thinking it was a worthwhile experience. And I know that sounds very mean, but that's what I think. So more in the video down below, more in the deep dive on less down below. Check out all of those if you want more. If you have thoughts about any of the things that I have talked about in this video, let me know in the comment section down below. If you have recommendations or thoughts, uh, referrals based on any of the books that I've talked about and liked or disliked, let me know that in the comment section down below. I would love to hear what you have been reading or watching this week. We started watching Junior Bake Off, and I'm not sure I like it based on the one episode we have watched so far. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.